It's really exciting to be here uh, with so many people that I know and to meet, meet so many uh, new people as well. Um, today I'm going to talk ab about an essay that I'm writing called Imagination um, for a, a new book that's called Keywords for Environmental Studies. It's forthcoming from New York University Press. And my co-editor is sitting in the audience, William Gleason, and our other co-editor is uh, David Pello. And we are compiling a volume that will create what we would like to think of as a state of the field list of 60 keywords that aim to provide a cross-disciplinary breadth of information about the historical and contemporary meanings, both settled and contested, of the key words structuring the most exciting research in and across environmental studies and the sciences of nature. And um, I'm going to go to my next slide, which you'll be able to see. Let's see. You'll be able to see the key words uh, that we will be including in our volume. And I've heard a couple of the keywords already today, so you'll, you'll see that Cosmos is there, and, um, we'll, and you'll see that Sublime is, all, is there as well. Uh, our, our aim is to get scientists, social scientists, and environmental humanists uh, talking to each other, and these are the keywords that we hope will get them talking to each other. Oh, we've heard extinction today, too. So the uh, deeper roots of this project come from, can be found in Raymond Williams' Keywords book. Uh, Williams insisted that his book was not a dictionary or a glossary of particular academic subjects. It is rather, he said, a record of an inquiry into a vocabulary. So if we were going to start talking to each other, scientists and uh, humanists, uh, what would be the words that would get us to talk to each other? Williams understood the ongoing evolution of the histories and meanings of terms uh, that shape cultural and scientific terms. Uh, for this reason, he placed uh, uh, his now uh, iconic set of blank pages at the end of the volume, where he encouraged scholars and thinkers to add key keywords and rewrite old ones. Uh, so my co-editors and I, Bill, uh, hope that each essay in the volume, uh, written on the blank pages as it were, will contribute to the broader critical conversations surrounding the interplay of nature and culture, or what Donna Haraway has termed nature culture. Uh, the impetus for the keywords volume might be said to be a series of unrelenting crises, which we just saw uh, so uh, movingly photographed in, in um, the previous uh, presentation oil spills, uh, reactor meltdowns, superstorms, which seem to require our immediate attention. Factor in events such as the 2009 Copenhagen talks for the United Nations Conference of Parties, uh, which were considered largely a failure since the richest nations rejected binding agreements on climate change. And earlier 2007 um, IPCC report uh, concluded that, quote, the worst case scenarios are already occurring, sea levels are rising, o oceanic acid levels are increasing, ice sheets moving beyond the pattern of natural variability. And even earlier than that, in 2002, atmospheric chemists Paul Critson and biologist uh, Eugene Sturmer uh, had declared that the Earth has entered into a new epoch in its history, which they referred to as the Anthropocene. So Anthropocene is one of the key words. Um, they argue that a, a key transformation of the planet's life began some 200 years ago, when human activity began growing uh, into a significant and morphological force. Um, that's, of course, debatable. And your, your photographs uh, just showed what the developing notion of the Anthropocene so well. Yet, despite all of these reports, there seems to be still a baffling and discon disastrous disconnections between cognitive awareness of anthropogenic environmental crisis and climate change and the generally insignificant alterations of lifestyles um, among humans, specifically in first world countries and the most developed countries, seem prepared to countenance. So since the early 1990s, the humanities have been step stepping more forcefully and imaginatively and successfully into these debates. It is still the case, however, that the general public tends to look to the humanities, uh, tends not to look to the humanities for solutions to environmental challenges. For solutions, they tend to look to scientists, engineers, economics, medical researchers, or public policy specialists who often see the methods of human humanistic research as irrelevant to their own. 
However, on the pages of Keywords for Environmental Studies, we expect readers to discover that something is happening in the disciplines of the academy and even outside the academy. We are moving into a, per a period in which the disciplines seem to be, and I'm going to just use a little biological term, um, recoding each other. Each of our disciplines are recoding the others. This transdisciplinarity, we could call it, or recoding, is in turn changing the ways that we imagine what Raymond Williams stated in his keywords essay on nature has come to, to, to mean, and this is sort of the old name, uh, understanding of nature, unspoiled places or plants and creatures other than man. We're going to see that, that, that the, the you know, meaning of nature is, is changing into something else. So in many of the essays in the Keywords book, readers are, are going to discover how research in biology, chemistry, and physics, once on the margins of the humanities and social sciences, is pressing into the foreground of the fields of anthropology, literary studies, history, politics, economics, geography, and scholars um, such as anthro uh, an anthropologist and eco-critic Deborah Bird Rose uh, are calling for new forms of what she calls writing in the Anthropocene. And she's also uh, calling for paying more attention to what she calls the situated connectivities that bind us into multi-species uh, communities. She calls, uh, what her, she calls her work uh, multi-species ethnography, and she, she will write the keyword ethnography. Um, as S. Eben Kirksey and Stefan Helmreich uh, explain, what is happening might be described as something like a rhizomatic zeitgeist. That is a gathering up of the sensibilities of Charles Darwin, Gregory Bateson, Donna Haraway, Bruno Latour, Isabel Stengers, Marisol de la Cadena, others, to pull creatures, animals, plants, fungi, and microbes, once confined to the realm of zoe or bare life, that which is killable into the realm of bios, uh, and to argue that, that uh, these non-human creatures have legibly biographical and political lives. So um, the word rhizomorphic is explored in Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus. As a metaphor, uh, uh, the rhizome, they argue, which is a subterranean fleshy uh, stem of a plant, richly suggests the ways in which transdisciplinary research allows for multiple non-hierarchical entry and exit points in data representation and interpretation. In an, in an article, and now I'm, I'm not talking about Deleuze and Guattari anymore, I, I, in an article called At the Root of the Wood Wide Web, yes, you heard that right, Wood Wide Web, uh, by uh, a scientist named Emanuela Giovanetti and her group of researchers who study rhizomatic systems, um, they note that the rhizome and its companion species are doing more than acting as a metaphor for literary scholars. Um, they explain that arbuscular mycorrhizal fun fungi, or fungi, uh, also known as AM fungi, uh, are a type of fungus that penetrates the cortical cells of the roots of vascular plants. Um, this fun fungi have a wide host range and are able to colonize and interconnect contigu contiguous plants by means of long branching filamentous structures of fungus extending from one root system to another. Now just, just to sort of simplify that, um, tree roots will have these fung fungal networks uh, stretching not only from their own roots but into other plants and so all the plants on the forest floor are connected. So that's basically what, that, what this slide is sort of pointing out. This is, this is a this is a photograph of how, how the, the root systems of different plants are being um, uh, connected. So studies of these systems, uh, playfully dubbed Wood Wide Web, have shown that these uh, fun fungi are mutualistic symbionts living in the roots of 80% of land plant species, and they, they develop extensive below ground um, uh, uh, filaments uh, that for the uptake and transfer of soil nutrients uh, to host plants. However, 
um, fun fungi in the soil seem to be engaged in a kind of sig semiotic signaling, and this is where um, he, uh, humanists and scientists are coming together over this notion of, you know, what is semiosis and, and, and who, who, what can communicate. As they build mu mutually beneficial networks between plants for the distribution of nutrients in the soil. So, do roots and fungi have then stories to tell? Are they themselves telling stories through a kind of chemical signaling? And um, is the wood wide web offering one illustration of the reasons why both uh, environmental humanists and scientists are coming together to study matter in all its forms? And now I'm going to use a term um, from Serenella Iovina and Serpil Operman, who are eco critics, um, studying matter as a site of narrativity. A, 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 and thinking of matter as storied matter, um, and thinking of it as having embodied narratives of its own um, in the very structure of its own self-constructive forces. So the ways uh, that roots uh, and f f fungi communicate reveals one of the greatest needs for the imagination, and that's my keyword. Um, I'm, I'm writing the keyword on imagination. It's kind of daunting. I, it's intimidating to write the keyword on imagination. So can we now, knowing these kinds of things, uh, speak of multi-species connectivities as storied matter? The problem for us today, writes anthropologist Edward Co Eduardo Cohn, is how to think or how to imagine the non-human which has been an analytical category that Bruno Latour proposed as he sought to uh, move ethnographic study of science making uh, practices beyond social constructivist frameworks in which humans are the only actors. However, where some of Latour's early work fails to recognize that some non-humans are not just represented but represent and that they can do so without having to speak, argues for narratives about storied matter uh, that would explode what Cohn calls the closed self-referential self anthropolo uh, anthropological analytics that focus only on human language, human culture, human society, and history to explain that instead both the human and the non-human are communicating. Obviously, we'd have to come up with uh, new ways of thinking about what communication means, right? Uh, it can't just be explained in human languages. Cohn would reground notions of communication in what he calls interactions between species in a representational system that gets beyond the dualism of the human non-human. Um, oh, oh, sorry getting ahead of myself, um, and opens what he calls the space of the hyphen between nature culture. So to look at what's going on there, not just uh, hyphenate nature culture, but to look at what's going on in the space there. Um, and, and to reveal the semiosis that is, quote, always embedded in some way or another and always entangled to a greater or lesser degree with material processes, such as the transfer of nutrients uh, through uh, f uh, fungal networks. So this turn to the material, as it's being called by uh, scholars like Jane Bennett, Karen Barad, Stacey Alima, and others, is challenging the imagination by contesting strictly bounded dualism separating mind, body, and epistemology ontology. So the notion that plants and other non-humans might have biographical lives uh, raises questions about the ways humans have imaginatively employed anthropomorphism and anthropomorphizing uh, narrative techniques that may script, and, and this is my argument, may script environmental ethical concern uh, in explanation of how the world works. Although anthropomorphism has been routinely dismissed in recent environmental uh, studies circles, in vibrant matter, political ecologist Jane uh, Bennett argues that, quote, the humanization of things, places, natural elements, non-human animals, is not necessarily a sign of an anthropocentric and hierarchical vision. Instead, anthropomorphizing representations can reveal what she calls similarities and symmetries between humans and non-humans. Looked at this way, anthropomorphism might potentially work against anthropocentrism, and Darwin himself 
uh, and, and she's, uh, you know, many people are getting some ideas about this from Darwin himself, who looked for similarities and symmetries in plants. Uh, he initiated the study of the role of electrical currents in plant movement. Today, this area of study, and, and of course we know that in between Darwin and now, this area of study got completely dismissed and now we're sort of um, hearing about it again. Uh, today, this new research uh, uh, on the wood wide web is being called you know, plant neurobiology. Um, and is showing that plants uh, orient and react appropriately not only in response to light, but also to wind, water, predators, qu quality of soil, and volumes of available soil, among many other factors. So if we treat this information as quote unquote storied matter, we might discover, as Donna Haraway puts it, that it matters what ideas we think with and Thinking with new ideas, we might begin to think about matter by employing narrative techniques such as self-similarity and imaginatively using anthropomorphic language to raise questions about storied matter such as these. These are just some, some imaginative questions we, we might ask. Uh, do plants forage for light? Do they actively avoid shade? Should we say that plants decide where to send their roots, that they know that they should send roots down into the ground and stems up into the sky or um, uh, a body up into the sky? Do questions such, in other words, just by changing those words, we change the way we think about plants. Um, and that's what Haraway means when she says um, ideas, that the ideas we use to think about ideas matter. So do questions such as these allow us to transfer scale and contemplate patterns and flows of relations that we might not normally notice uh, because human movement is typically, now, now, now I'm thinking of Day of the Traffids if you've ever read that novel, that 1951 novel about plants that can actually walk and move and kill people. It's a cool novel, my students are reading it right now, it's a 1951 novel. And um, anyway, so we've been talking about how plants don't move fast enough often for humans to notice that. That's why sometimes we, we get these rapid uh, photographs of, of the development of plants and we can actually see them moving in rapid photography. But normally we, we don't notice that. So as the sunflower's face moves across the sky, we're not really watching its movement. Um, and so in this novel, you know, the plants get up and move and walk around and kill people and so people start noticing that they're moving. Um, but normally we don't no notice those things. So as Mitchell Thomas show uh, argues, uh, employing narrative uh, can allow us to what, this is a quote from his book, uh, Bringing the Biosphere Home. He's writing the keyword for education. Um, conjures correspondence be co correspondences between biospheric knowledge systems and everyday life uh, observations, unquote. So in Bringing the Biosphere Home, Thomas Show ranges widely through the work of scientists, creative writers, spiritual traditions to argue that narratives or stories um, are one of the primary sites for the imagination. And at the same time, a crucial element in both the sciences and humanities because uh, they facilitate the discovering, discovery of those symmetry, symmetries and similarities. He is fascinated, for example, by the way leading scientists like Lynn Margulies in The Symbiotic Planet interprets the evolution of the biosphere by framing narratives about the uh, biographical life of bacteria with the details of her own biography, her own life story. And, and she describes uh, the delight she feels in escaping from the essential activities taking place in her laboratory and the urban sprawl of human hyperactivity when she sinks her hands into the bio, uh, bacterial ooze living in the microbial mats of the remote salt flats of San Quentin Bay in Baja, California. Even, even scientists need to narrate, she says, and to integrate their observations into origin stories, unquote. Like Margulies, who is telling the story of life at microscopic scales, Tyler Volk, who will write our keyword for uh, biosphere, um, tells us that the, that the story of life at the microscopic level is also taking place. Um, Volk observes that there is a growing recognition that, quote, all bioessential elements have unique stories, unquote. 
So narrative or imagination provides the cognitive shortcuts, you might say, that humans must master to be able to interpret their relation to 4.5 billion years of biogeochemical evolution on Earth and begin to comprehend, um, and these are Tomasho's words, quote, the stunning juxtapositions of scales involved in the dramatic biospheric changes that are affecting all life on Earth in the Anthropocene, unquote. So in my uh, book called American Indian Literature, Environmental Justice and Ecocriticism, The Middle Place, which was one of the first uh, literary uh, books to, to, to do what some critics call shift the field in, a, in the direction of eco-justice revisionism, um, I, I explore how humans have been attempting to comprehend the stunning juxtapositions of scale and understand their own place in the cosmos for thousands of years through stories that anthropomorphize uh, ecological processes in the shape of gods who transform themselves into animals or plants or whose activities become associated with particular geographical places. Often these stories are told in cycles that have cosmo um, cosmopolitical import, um, such as the Pope of Vu, the, the Mayan creation story, um, and I, I have a reading of that in my book. As Dennis Tedlock explains in the introduction to his translation of the Pope of Vu, this text has been, um, was uh, written down in Latin and classical Spanish soon after the arrival of the Spanish friars. And even today, centuries later, it still often uh, offers a contemporary Mayan people, quote, a complex navigational system which they consider as a, a, a seeing instrument. So they call the, the Pope of Vu uh, a seeing instrument for understanding human relations to stars, animals, soils, plant, uh, and planting soils, planting soils and each other. So the Pope of Vu is just one example of a genre of text known as the Almanac, um, which allowed the Mayans to quote unquote see spans of time unavailable to a single human in a, in a single lifetime, and thus offers them ex access um, in, understanding, in, in the understanding of social and environmental change at planetary levels, uh, the bio, at biospheric levels, but also um, um, scales of time. So uh, the Pope of um, Vu um, has uh, what, what I call a cosmological cycle of stories that can still be found throughout the uh, Americas, and, that, and it's just one example of these uh, complex uh, cycles of stories, or what, what I call archives, that are helping us to explain why 30,000 delegates who uh, gathered at the 2010 uh, World People's Conference on the Rights of Mother Earth and Climate Change make reference to what they call, and this is a quote from the preamble, cosmovisions thousands of years in the making. This conference was a response to the 2007 IPCC report that states that it will be the poor nations that will be most vulnerable to even modest levels of atmospheric temperature rise. However, the most vulnerable nations decided not to wait for their global north counterparts to act. Delegates at the World People's Conference employed their traditional cosmological narratives as imaginative tools for making abstract, often intangible global patterns, which, are, um, which affect global South nations disproportionately, more visible to a wider public. Um, in the declaration that they wrote um, at the conference, they argue that multiple species, including humans, humans as one, one of the species on the planet, should be granted the right uh, to regenerate biocapacity and continue vital cycles. And they're not talking about human rights. They're going beyond the boundaries of what we call human rights to talk about rights for all, all of the living species on the planet. Um, in, now, now I'm going to just go on a, off, off on a, just a tiny tangent here. Um, in an imaginative thought experiment he titles Circulating Reference, included in Pandora's Hope, Essays on Reality of Science uh, Studies, Bruno Latour references another notable almanac or cosmological archive of knowledge, first written down sometime around 700 BC by Greek writer Hesiod. Um, now, Hesiod was writing during a time of great agricultural crisis in his region. The weather was bad, the soils were poor, and Hesiod was c concerned about scarcity and greed. He was really bothered that his own people were going out as colonizers, uh, being sent out to search for new lands with better conditions. 
So, in a long poem he titled Works and Days, which has been called the first almanac, some people refer, refer to it as the first almanac, he, he set down into verse a, a well-known or, Greek oral tradition in which several malicious beings escape from a box while one, the goddess Astraea, who is associated with justice, remains trapped and um, she's unable to escape from, from the box. So all the malicious beings get out and justice is still in the box. Um, the story of Pandora's box becomes a scene instrument, um, just like the Pope of Vu, uh, that allows Hesiod and later Bruno Latour to entertain the qu these questions. Is it possible to build a livable political order? And is it possible to protect nature from greed when we have you know, excavations on the scale, um, which we saw in the photographs before, uh, before this presentation. So like Hesiod, the delegates to the World uh, People's Conference on the Rights of Mother Earth are working for uh, multinatural, not multicultural, but multinatural perspectives and enlisting ancient uh, cosmovisions in contemporary debates. They are organizing to build a livable cosmos plus politics or cosmopolitics where humans acknowledge the rights of sentient beings, forests, rivers, and mountains to maintain and continue uh, their evolutionary cycles. So like Latour, uh, James Cameron, and now I'm going to switch into talking about Avatar because I, I use Avatar, the matrix, uh, uh, you know, cloud atlas to talk to my students about climate change. I figure if you can get to where they live, which is in video, and move them uh, to, to what you want, want them to start thinking about through thought experience, experiments like Avatar, then that's how we're gonna, we're gonna educate them about climate change. So like Latour, James Cameron may have been you know, attaching a circ the circulating reference of Pandora to his blockbuster film, Avatar, which uh, in order to associate with he Hesiod's critique of human greed. In Avatar, an Earth Corporation, uh, the Resource Development Administration, or RDA, and I think I need to move to the next slide, um, uh, is, is there, you know, as you know, uh, if you've seen the film, to mine unobtainium. Not really subtle, right? Unobtainium. Uh, uh, but, but one of the main ca characters of the film is uh, a scientist, a xenobotanist named Grace Augustine. And Grace is trying to convince the head of the uh, research development uh, um, association that the real wealth of uh, Pandora is not unobtainium, but it is in the complex root system of Pandora. Her words fall on deaf ears, and the CEO authorizes the launch of missiles from helicopter gunships that explode the great mother tree, which is called home tree, um, uh, with no thought to the life that will be lost. Cameron characterizes Grace as something of an Estrella, someone concerned with justice, one of those mm -hmm. goddesses still in the box. Um, and she's acutely aware that her own research is being researched by the, the funds being uh, generated by uh, Unobtainium. And she's really bothered by the fact that um, all of this is disrupting the e ecosystemic uh, relationships, um, not just with home tree, but all of the plant, uh, beings on the planet. So uh, Pandora, of course, is being threatened uh, uh, with total systems uh, breakdown. So James Cameron's Avatar, I, I, I want to pair this today with another film called The Trees Have Mothers by Juan Carlos uh, Galeano, uh, who is a, a Colombian-American poet and filmmaker. Um, and he bases this film that he makes on a, a collection of, of folklore, and I'm going to compare this collection of folklore to Hesiod's works and da days and, and um, to the Pope of Vu. A collection of fo folklore uh, bringing together, uh, he, he went down to the Amazon and collected the folklore um, of the Amazonian people that live in the Amazon basin and also up in, into the Andes. Um, and he puts, puts a lot of this folklore into a documentary um, and both, both Avatar and also The Trees Have Mothers both employ anthropomorphic narrative techniques that mean to engage their audiences in reimagining human relationship to other species. Both serve as acts of the imagination that encourage uh, what you might call ma mastery of the juxtaposition of scale from the microscopic rhizomes in the soil to the macroscopic mother of trees. Um, 
So, so Cameron sets the film, let's see, where am I at in my PowerPoint? Cameron sets the film 145 years uh, in the future and focuses on Grace Augustine, um, who is studying the networked energy of the Pandoran plant life uh, that, according to her own logbooks and an ethnography that she writes, which becomes a bestseller on Earth, so uh, it's a, 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 an ethnography, um, she's studying the, this energy that spreads like what she calls uh, neural pathways in the human brain with every tree and every plant act acting as one vast sentience covering the land, unquote. While most of the audience will assume that Grace's work is science fantasy, Cameron directed his production team to make sure that Grace's uh, research would be scientifically credible and adhere to the known laws of physics and biology. He hired botanist, uh, University of California, uh, Riverside botanist, Jody Holt, to, uh, to, to create the, the set and, the, and the, the labs. And Holt suggested that communication am among plants could credibly be uh, explained through the language of what's a, 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 an emerging field of research that's being called signal transduction, which is an area of research um, in the emerging field of biosemiotics. Uh, in which biologists study the rhizomatic processes of the wood wide web. Again, that's just the popular term, wood wide web. Or in other words, the ways that plant roots uh, in the forest soils, quote unquote, communicate, or more precisely, perceive and interpret their environment through chemical gradients or intensities of light. Grace's ethnobotanical description of her research on the sentience of plants and trees also clearly owes a debt uh, to Darwin's initial four ways forays into what is today referred to as plant biology, which I spoke about a minute ago. So the networked rhizomatic systems of Pandora are represented uh, as a forest spirit that the Navi call Awa, and which Cameron represents as a female deity. This aspect of the film, although greatly criticized by the critics when the film, uh, the film critics and, and also literary critics when it came out, um, is correlates with aspects of Amazonian indigenous cultures uh, which have been represented by poet Juan Carlos Galeano in his collection uh, Folklore of the Amazon, which I showed you a minute ago, um, and in his uh, film The Trees Have Mothers. Um, Amazonian oral narratives, um, and, and I, I, this is just a tree, that, uh, th this is just a tree that I think you can kind of see why we're calling these uh, forest mothers. Look at the way they, they uh, extend down into the, into the water and then up into the uh, canopy. Uh, Amazonian oral narratives tell of humans living in enchanted cities with forest spirits and men who comb the hair of the trees they love and plants that have mothers. Galeano left his native Colombia at the age of 18, but returns each summer to hunt, fish, plant with a mixed Afro-indigenous groups who continue to work for a subsistence living in the Amazonian basin. He also uh, uh, works at Air, uh, Florida State University as a professor and takes groups of students down to the Amazon every summer to learn about the folklore. There, he still hears the cosmological tales about forest mothers he was told as a boy. And these are the, the tales that he's collected in his uh, uh, folk tales of the Amazon. While the forest spirits are often collectively referred to in South America as Pachamama, a term understood by the people themselves not as a female gendered planet, but as quote unquote, source of life, source of light. And by the way, uh, Pachamama is all, uh, often um, represented as androgynous, and often as a sort of misshapen being with one foot, one foot turned backwards. Um, so this being called Pachamama, Yukamama, Sachamama is a sentient en entity that may sometimes transform into the shape of a giant boa constrictor on which all the forest uh, life grows. Um, in the trees have mothers, Galliano makes visible the things the mothers of trees, the forest spirits, the mountains, the jaguars, and the dolphins, the pink dolphins, that ordinary Amazonian peoples and the delegates of the World People's Conference uh, on the Rights of Mother Earth are naming as allies in their fight against environmental exploitation and climate change. Stories about trees or dolphins that transform into human shapes and interact with modern day Amazonian peoples help to articulate a cosmos of increasingly 
complex, multicultural, multi-natural, uh, uh, and multi-species relationships that are being um, changed by chemical spills, overfishing, wildcat mining, water pollution, and poverty. The articulation of these relationships works. Um, uh, the, the articulation of these um, relationships works as something that Peruvian American anthropologist Marisol de la Cadena has called cosmopolitics, um, or cosmos plus politics. Cosmopolitics, as de, de la Cadena explains, following Isabel Stenger's work, um, uh, is different than cosmopolitanism, the Kantian extension of universal uh, hospitality to exclude heterogeneous people in an already known common world. Okay, so if com cosmopolitanism equals common world that we all eventually will get to, then cosmopolitics is something different. Following Isabel Stenger's De La Cadena outlines a vibrant indigenous cosmopolitical movement. Uh, now, many decades in the, in the making, and I, I just, I, I always want to emphasize with my uh, audience that, that you know, it, um, Global South environmentalisms did not start in the 1960s and 70s, and they are not derivative of, of North American environmentalisms. They started many decades, and if, if, you, if you believe what I argue in my book, American Indian Literatures, then they go back to the very first uh, indigenous uh, uprisings uh, hundreds of years ago, and every slave revolt uh, uh, around the planet. So cosmopolitics is something different. It's not cosmopolitanism. Um, Stengers, though, in thinking about what cosmopolitanism cosmopolitics would be, uh, takes its two constituent parts, cosmos and politics. Um, and she articulates cosmos to mean the unknown, constituted by the multiple divergent worlds and politics to the articulation of which they would eventually be capable. So politics then is articulation of these multinatural uh, relationships which are still, in so many cases, we still don't understand them. Um, and so politics would be the eventual articulation of that which we don't yet um, understand. So the definition of cosmopolitics summons us to reimagine what to us are and will continue to be mountains, rivers, glaciers, trees, not as parts of a universal world, but as multiple worlds at multiple scales. Um, so different, uh, so, so, co so this cosmopolitics that I'm talking about is different from both universalism and relativism. This is a politics of the cosmos that invites us to think of a pluriverse instead of a universe. This is an alternate mode of imagining the world that results uh, from relations, not from the action of subjects, either collective or individual. Entities emerge from interactions, as physicist Karen Burrard describes them. Thus viewed, entities are never singular. Uh, they are inter-intra-related. They are more than one, less than many. Um, and Barad, at the center of the material turn in the humanities and social sciences, calls such interactions world-making relations. So stories about human relationships with mother trees, anacondas, pink dolphins abide by a complex philosophy, um, and this is represented in Juan Carlos Galeano's work, of world-making relations that have been uh, termed by Brazilian anthropologist Eduardo Viviers de la Castro as perspectival multinaturalism. This is a notion that suggests that the world is inhabited by different sorts of subjects or persons, human and non-human, which apprehend reality from distinct points of view. And I like to just explain this by saying that when I look out at this audience, I see something different than my dog would see if my dog was looking out at this audience because my dog has a different body than me. So our perspectives are embodied, literally embodied in our material selves. And uh, dogs see differently. Um, even though we've evolved as companion species, we to see farther distances and they to smell, to, to literally see with their noses. So this is what Viviaros de, de la Castro is talking about when he talks about uh, a materially embodied perspective that apprehends reality from distinct points of view. 
Uh, these velocities speak of humans, animals, and spirits participating in the same world, although with different sensory apparatus con constituting not just multicultural or human worlds that imply a unity of nature and a multiplicity of cultures, but multinatural worlds that imply corporeal diversity and its attendant diversity of perspectives. Knowledge of small-scale regional multinatural relationships represented um, as forest mothers, or large-scale riverine ecosystemic relationships represented as mother of all water beings, um, have been archived in these oral uh, traditions in their various forms, oral or written, by Amazonian and Andean people and continue even today to offer humans understandings of how the world came to be through a series of transformations, often violent and predatory, over the course of geological and biospheric time. And I would encourage you to all look at um, Juan Carlos's uh, little 70 minute film, uh, which is free on the internet um, at the at the uh, website that I just flashed on, on a previous slide. So oral stories uh, like those collected in um, works and day, Hesiod's works and days, and later, uh, and more recently, by Juan Carlos Galeano, be, began to be systematically collected in the Americas in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. These collections have a genealogy that extends back to German geologist Alexander von Humboldt's travels in the Amazon at the end of the 18th century. In a, pa a passage to Cosmos, Laura Dasso Wall's brilliant study of Humboldt, um, Walls describes how Humboldt's wide-ranging research in Europe and South America influenced an intellectual network which included figures both mainstream and dissident who would deploy his ideas in often contradictory ways throughout the 19th century and into the 21st. One of the dissidents was Franz Boas, a German geography, geographer who studied the Inuit people of what is now the Canadian North in British Columbia and later shaped um, uh, the emerging field of anthropology. And I know um, Boas is a very controversial uh, figure and, and that's not really what I'm pointing out today. Rather, I just want to point out, out one of his ideas that you can trace directly to, um, to um, Humboldt. And that is that Boas considered every phenomena and phenomenon worthy of being studied for its own sake and at Columbia University trained a generation of scholars including Zora Neale Hurston uh, who would shape the field of ethnography. He said that a cosmographer, and this was his word, uh, um, studies what he called the history of phenomena, what they are and how they came to be and to be just that way and cherishes the very particulars that science uses and then often throws away. Today, ethnographers like Juan Carlos Galeano continue to collect the oral, astronomical, ceremonial, cultural, agroecological, ethnobotanical knowledges of diverse ethnic groups around the world and treat them as archives of sophisticated cosmographies um, rather than simplistic folklore or superstitions. After returning to Europe, inspired by his interactions with the indigenous peoples that he met in the Amazon, Humboldt published his magnus, magnum opus, the five-volume Cosmos, which would influence a generation of thinkers on several continents. Humboldt defined nature, again, let's think just going back to uh, William's key word on nature, he defined nature as, quote, a planetary interactive causal network operating across multiple scale levels, temporal and spatial. And he did that at the end of the 18th century, or in, 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 into, the, um, um, into the 19th. He was one of the first Europeans to warn about the links between deforestation, environmental change, and depopul depopulation. Arguably, these are the kinds of links associated with climate science today and opened up a space of possibility for what we're today calling multi-species ethnography and cosmopolitics. So later Humboldt's thinking would come uh, to be foundational to the science of what would later become ecology, another key word. Uh, but before ecology could become a science, Walls observes, it was a discourse that arose from Humboldt's imagination. It had to be imagined thence to be re represented, then circulated, and reimagined in works of great beauty and art, 
sometimes scholarly, sometimes artistic, from Humboldt forward among many thinkers and poets and artists. His thinking spread rhizomatically from Coleridge to Darwin to Emerson to Franz Boas. Each employed Humboldt's words to imagine new ways of envisioning human relation to the cosmos. So, Cameron's and Galliano's films are acts of the imagination that become cosmological instruments for seeing multi-species relationships existing in intimate, entangled relations. Stories of forest mothers make the invisible processes necessary to continued biospheric and ecosystemic uh, vitality visible, quote unquote, visible. They, in, in, in the form of transformational animals and, and tree mothers and, and um, dolphins who change into people at night. Um, they invite us to think about the limits um, of nature culture, the limits of the nature culture divide, and reimagine a singular world ruled, uh, and reimagine this singular world with a singular politics as something else, a multiple world with multiple politics. They invite us to reimagine the world as we know it through a politics of the cosmos. Um, so Cameron and Galliano and the academics that I have referenced today are calling upon oral story archives and as thought experience, as thought experiments, as seen instruments or cosmovisions thousands of years in the making to propose that we cease provincializing the universe into one and see the emergence or re-emergence of the pluriverse. Thank you. Well, I just spent the last two days with Donna Haraway, and um, so my thinking about that question is very complex, and let me just try to, to just uh, talk a little bit about what's been called the material turn. Um, um, I don't necessarily agree with everything that Jane Bennett writes in her book about the, uh, how discovering these relationships uh, uh, you know, in matter or between uh, species and relations makes us absolutely um, um, horizontal, which would imply a, you know, a kind of emerging ethics, right? If we were all equally valued um, and we understood that we all have the right to exist, then we um, would be horizontal or a, a, new, a new sort of ethics might emerge from the notion of, of horizontality. And I just don't really agree with that. And in fact, that's, that, that notion is one of the things that's, that, that sort of sent me down to the Amazon to start studying um, uh, n not just um, Humboldt and his, his interactions with the people there, but um, these relationships that Juan Carlos Galliano is talking about. So in the documentary with Juan Carlos Galliano, you see, you see the incredible complexity of what it means to live in the Amazon today, where literally, you know, the brick countries have, have already sort of split up the continent and, and also split up Africa into, you know, who's going to mine what and who's going to cut which forests and where are we going to grow soy. Um, and, um, and, and the fact is, is that most of the people that live, say, in uh, Peru and Colombia still use manioc um, as their main uh, dietary source. And manioc has no protein in it, which means that the people there still very much rely on hunting. And, you know, in, in, um, among many environmental communities, you know, uh, hunting is sort of taboo. And so how does that fit in? 
And these, uh, these stories, these folk, folk stories from the Amazon, they, they begin to explain relationships in a way that in fact does not horizontalize, but in fact um, insists that we must know our boundaries, um, that the human is a bounded spe species in that we're bounded literally by our bodies, whereas a jaguar is also bounded by his or her body. Um, and so are all of those chickens we saw in the, in the photos, you know, the billions of chickens that are being, you know, processed for humans, humans to eat. We're all bounded in our bodies, and, um, and, and our bodies give us perspectives, but we can cross boundaries, and we can understand, we can understand the perspectives of others, and we have an ethical responsibility to, to understand um, um, the perspectives of others. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we can be perfectly horizontal because we still will need to eat. We will need to ingest. And as um, Donna Haraway has been saying to me for, for two, two days now, um, we're starting to think that we, we, might be the, we might be the result of a virus, you know? Uh, cells might be the re result of viruses. In other words, things eat and are ingested and, and infect, and um, we're not all horizontal. And so those fields of soy that you see in Brazil, you know, say if you're a vegetarian and you eat soy, you know, are you thinking about all of those, um, all of the rainforest that was cut, cut down for your soy? I mean, maybe your soy is non-GMO, I don't know, but um, maybe your soy comes from the Amazon. Um, and so even if you're a vegetarian and you're not um, eating chickens, any, any of those chickens, you don't know what life you know, has been impacted by uh, the very fact that you must eat, you must eat. Um, and so uh, when my students, um, when Ken said a minute ago he, that your, your students are always asking you, you know, how can I make a difference? I like to tell them that they, they just need to start educating themselves about what's going into their mouth. Not, not in simplistic sorts of ways with you know, her heritage vegetables. By the way, I'm a proponent of heritage vegetables and we'll talk about that later. Um, but understanding uh, the complexity of the processes of everything that goes into your mouth. mouth. And, and students, I, my students tend to find that less depressing than the fact that, you know, um, that, you know the glaciers are almost gone. And uh, they, they, they tend to, 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 to think that there is something they can do. And so we talk a lot about agriculture. And so that's a great question, and it's so complex, and I think I could go on, and, and, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, maybe one more question, so we don't run too late. So maybe we can get back on schedule. Then. So uh, thank you, Joni. This was thank great. You. Thank you.